Testing, testing. One, two, three. Yep, I can hear you. Can you hear me as well? Hey, I, yes. I look horrible, man. I'm not yet. Nabia. Let's let let's try uh, sharing screens. Uh, do okay. you want to try it first? Yes, I can share the screen. Um, let me see. API day. You can see it, right? Okay. Yes, I can see. Okay, great. Click twice to max my video. Okay, cool. So okay. can I? So uh, when you hand over, mm -hmm. uh, when you finish, I will share my screen. Mm -hmm. Can I try? Yeah. I just want to check whether two things. Um, so are you able to see my screen now? Yeah, cluster API. Yes, the whole Chrome and and the terminal. Yes, I can see the terminal. Okay, cool. That's all I wanted to test. Okay. Awesome. All right. So I will stop sharing and give it back to you. Let me share my video. You can see it, right? It's just loading. Yep, I can see it now. OK. But will the audience see uh, it in this fashion, or will they see it in a full screen? I don't know. Yeah. Is it too small, the phone, to you? Yeah, yeah, but because maybe I'm a speaker, it's appearing like this. I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe I should uh, actually if you share my video when I talk about that, right? Yeah, that's a good idea. I can also just. Oh, yeah. It don't minimize. OK. Ah, you can double click to maximize the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So maybe yeah, we can. I can uh, tell the audience to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we should tell the audience to double click the screen. In that case. Oh, okay. I think resizing doesn't help. It doesn't help in resizing. <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe this one different than that. Perfect. It is the video done here, right? For you, it's done. For me, it's done here. Are you the same down here on the? For me, yeah, it, it is done okay. now. Okay. No, no, no. One second. Still going. Cube CTL. Yeah, it's still going actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can. Yeah. Yeah, I'm playing that, so uh, should be fine. Okay. Awesome. Actually, uh, yeah, I'm planning to do a live demo. <laughs> So let me pray first. I have a recorded video as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. So it's 12.50 now. Should we get started or? I think we are all 50 to go, right? We are starting at 50, isn't it? Yes. OK. So um, thank you for thank you for joining uh, this section. So uh, just like what Amit has mentioned in the chat window on, on your right-hand side, 
uh, it would be great if you can say hi to us so that we know that you are participating in the, uh, the sharing workshops. So uh, I think without further ado, uh, we, we should first introduce ourselves. So uh, myself is Him Lam. I'm the platform uh, advisory platform architect. Uh, belongs to the uh, Tensu application platform architecture team, um, serving APJ customer. So um, in the in in the window in the middle that on, on my right hand side, uh, we have uh, Amif uh, Nabir, uh, who he is the um, senior solution engineer uh, from the modern application and platform business unit. So um, Amif, would you like to introduce yourself also? Yep. Thank you, Hin. You did a good job. You got my surname right this time. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amit Nambiar, and I'm a senior solutions engineer uh, at, in the modern applications and platforms business unit at uh, VMware. Um, uh, I work with customers and prospects uh, on their cloud native uh, journey. And uh, recently, I've been working on Kubernetes and uh, their Kubernetes adoption uh, for our customers. Back to you, Hin. Thank you. So uh, today we are going to talk about uh, extending Kubernetes with uh, custom resources definitions. And then we will be also dive deep into API-driven customer provisioning. So uh, just like what Amit have mentioned, uh, we serve customer that uh, uses uh, Kubernetes and we actually have a product like called uh, Tensu Application Service. Tensu Applications and Tensu uh, Portfolio that has um, uh, Kubernetes and uh, its management tools and the whole set of um, uh, uh, functionalities around them to serve uh, application to run in a modern way. So um, today we are we are going to talk about several things. Uh, the first one is um, Kubernetes has a lot of API. So how do we like extend the API by using custom resource definitions? And on top of custom uh, resource definitions, we also uh, have uh, a new way to manage infrastructure. So um, we can we use uh, something called cluster API that Amif will um, uh, demonstrate to you on how to rewrite on top of uh, CLD in Kubernetes, extend the functionality and manage infrastructure for the team. And of course, for both sections, we have a very short demo um, to uh, show you uh, how things work uh, in, um, in, in life. Uh, well, for, for Amit is in life, but for me, I will, uh, uh, play a video to demonstrate, uh, how things work in, uh, custom resource definitions. So, uh, I will be jumping, uh, into, uh, the sections of custom resource definitions about, first of all, I will talk about how Kubernetes API works. And then I will talk about, Hey, uh, if we want to extend Kubernetes API, uh, how do we extend it using custom resource definition CLD in short? And then I will have a, a, an example about, hey, if you want to run database such as MySQL, uh, is there any easier way for you to extend Kubernetes such that you can work directly uh, in MySQL construct instead of um, a very uh, basic Kubernetes uh, construct? So, so first thing first, uh, we have uh, Kubernetes uh, that every Kubernetes and it has an API server and API server itself uh, actually is a RESTful API. So typically when you interact with Kubernetes, you are interacting with the API server and the API server will uh, get and store uh, the uh, status for the desired status of the uh, your Kubernetes cluster in ETCD as a backend. So your, your, when you interact with uh, Kubernetes, you can either write yourself uh, with the API client, such as using the Go client, using the Java library, and talk to the API server via HTTP, or you can use uh, very well known tools called kubectl, which uh, if you uh, have uh, play around with Kubernetes, you know kubectl actually is a, is, is a, is a API client to talk with the API server in Kubernetes. So when you submit um, your YAML file, actually you are constructing the um, object that you are trying to submit uh, in a RESTful way to uh, API server. So that's why the API server, uh, the Kubernetes is actually pretty RESTful API centric. 
and then the the endpoint that you are submitting to is um, in this structure like you have a prefix uh, saying that hey you are using the API and then you have something called group version and the resources itself so every resources or every kind kind uh, kind that we are talking about such as deployment such as the um, replica set such as stable set we call it a kind it's actually resources in the API server store in etcd and then the version of course uh, determined by uh, your your restful objects uh, construct so uh, different version may have different uh, looking in the uh, RESTful API call for that. And of course, the group is for easier con consumption so that you can group the similar functionality and resources in the, in the, in the different uh, API namespace or API path for easy consumption. So it's a really decorative way for you to declare the desired state of Kubernetes in API server. And once you have the resources declared, then you have back end that as a controller. The controller is the um, what we call operator that will listen to the changes of uh, status in the system. And then the controller is the one who take action. So for example, if you have a deployment YAML to um, API server, the API server is stored in EDCD, and then the controller, deployment controller will get informed, and then a controller will begin to deploy um, the port according to your template, will uh, make sure that the replica, the number of uh, port replica is uh, in, in the correct number. It will gradually converge the current status of uh, your Kubernetes cluster to the desired state that you have declared. So um, this is like uh, eventual consistent uh, model of that. And also it is very API uh, centric way of that. So when we talk about extending the API, we are talking about uh, submitting um, uh, definitions, new definitions to the API server. So uh, that's why we call it custom resource definition because we are trying to define something specific to you and Maybe your company has different resources type uh, that you can um, wrap it up as a resources and then tell API server, hey, this is something that customized by me, by the company, and your, your operator can use that directly. So let's have an example. Say your company use uh, MySQL database. So typically, if you, you are an operator, you have to create a lot of YAML, which means that you have to create use uh, a very basic Kubernetes construct to uh, construct the distributed system of um, MySQL. Well, assuming that my, your MySQL is running in a cluster mode, so you have like uh, three or more uh, instance of MySQL server, and they they will form a MySQL cluster internally. So. Um, so that's why when as an operator, you have to write YAML file for say, hey, how should I define the stateful set such that when the MySQL um, port is coming up, it will automatically mount the persistent volume. And when the port goes down and then uh, the stateful set will uh, rest array, will create a new port and then mount the persistent volume back. And then the sidecar for the port will uh, knowing how to join each others and then form a cluster itself. And then as an operator, you still have to uh, take care about how surface, how surfaces expose work so that you have a surface for read write requests and you have a surface for read query. So that is a, a lot of moving parts in, um, in this diagram and you have to do the upgrade, you have to do the operation and uh, you have uh, tons of uh, YAMLs files to manage with. And um, for this uh, architecture, um, there's a lot of moving parts for the operator. So that's why there's some initiative. There is some benefit for, the op for, for you to create um, a CLD to define the MySQL um, architecture and then let the operator do uh, just the MySQL itself. So in this diagram, it's not anything very complex. You can reference to Kubernetes, um, this URL. It's built in Kubernetes example. 
simplified in this diagram. But you can imagine uh, for this simplified diagram, you already have a lot of uh, things to manage. So that's why, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it would be great if you have an operator or something called MySQL controller um, that will uh, able to make the API call for for you to call the Kubernetes API to to provision all this moving part for you. And for the operator, it will be very easy to say, hey, I have a, a domain specific um, YAML file that is specific to MySQL. So this MySQL is something um, that the operator can build. And then uh, this custom resources definition will tell the API, hey, how to consume this setting and then inform MySQL controller to provision all this stuff. So the benefit, the benefit is everything, um, every logic about how to manage, upgrade um, those backend basic services can be built in into uh, MySQL controller, this example controller, and then your operator can focus in the um, in the uh, uh, in the how you should build MySQL itself rather than the heavy lifting of hey where should the surface name looks like uh, how should the MySQL port man the uh, uh, persistent volume stuff like that so that's why uh, you are able to benefit from the operator can continuously manage um, the uh, MySQL because when you do upgrade you upgrade the controller you 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 tell the controller to take action rather than the operator directly go into every individual uh, construct every individual uh, resources in kubernetes and then you can standardize that uh, and then you can reuse that and that is really easy to understand and consume because uh, when you see the mysql uh, cld in the uh, kubernetes you know this is uh, something specific to mysql uh, database and from the YAML file that I'm going to demonstrate to you, you can easily see how large is your cluster, how is the scale in, scale out policy, stuff like that. Uh, but of course, because you are actually warping the complexity of the uh, backend um, distributed uh, MySQL cluster, then you have to implement quite a bit of logic in the MySQL controller. So because of the time limit, today I'm going to demonstrate how it looks like uh, if you divide the CLD. But I'm not going to demonstrate how the logic of the controller uh, create the backend surface it required. So without further ado, maybe I should like uh, jump to CLD demo. Uh, let me switch, switch the um, CLD uh, video that I pre-recorded. Um, let's see. Let me share it. So for, for the audience, uh, if you see a very small window down, down here, you can double click it and then maximize the, the video because uh, my video will have quite a bit of text, uh, console text there. So first of all, um, at the beginning, we have two files. The first, the first file uh, is called CLD. So CLD.yaml in this, in this um, uh, YAML file is actually the definitions to tell API server, hey, API server, this is uh, some custom resources I defined. And it is called MySQL. The structure should look uh, A, B, C, D, E, and please validate the uh, things that operator submitted. So the first file is to tell the API server how to deal with the custom resources that I have defined it for you. And that's why it's called definitions. And then the second file is um, first mysql.yaml. It is something that your operator submit to the API server to define the mysql resources they need. So I will show you the content very soon. So as you can see, if I go to CLD, you will say, hey, this is a custom resources definitions. And we have uh, something called a uh, grouped namespace. Okay, so I have defined a new kind to call MySQL. So now API server should understand MySQL resources. And then if you open up the first MySQL.yaml, you can see on the left-hand side, 
there are free cluster. So you, you can see there are free YAML, well, actually free definition of my SQL cluster. You can see my SQL cluster A, my SQL cluster B, and my SQL cluster C. And you can see I have a very specific definition about, hey, the version I want, like 8.0, the database encoding maybe uh, is UTF-8 and the number of uh, ports I want to run is like cluster size is five. And I am clearly defined how do should I do auto scaling? How should I resources limit the CPU RAM and this for each port that I want? And then, <clears throat> and then you can, and then I actually define multiple um, cluster here. So you can see, you can see my videos title has uh, three kind of a cluster there. So if you jump into, into the uh, uh, CLD, we should create the custom resources definition. It's very easy. It's like, hey, you tell you tell uh, Cook Control to submit, uh, to create this CLD. And um, if you define it correctly, the API server should receive this instruction and say, hey, I now learned what new API resources I have. So you can see this is something that isn't built in. So you can see my SQLs is one of the kind, new kind, and it is in the uh, database.hinlam.io group so that you can see the um, resources is grouped into database slash MySQL there. And then right now we have API server uh, understand how CLD works. So now we can create the resources. So we have three resources created and three cluster individually, which you can see we have five nodes individually. And you can see I, I can use various built-in, um, uh, various name to query this CLD. Okay, so you can see the YAML file that I have submitted. So the API server, of course, uh, because it's a CLD, it has enhanced the um, content for that resources. So you can see there is a managed field, but the main specification is still there. So now uh, if we want to do something, we can actually do a scale actions in there. So interestingly, when you do, when you do, um, when you define custom resource definition, you can reuse a lot of command in kube control, which is scale. Uh, right now, I'm doing an example of scaling out the cluster B to seven nodes, well, all seven ports, and then uh, scale in cluster C to three ports. So you can see the command has been submitted. So this is some benefit that uh, you can extend custom resources definitions uh, in a decorative way, and you can you can leverage that pattern to uh, help you to um, build construct that is a lot more complex than um, when you build using a built-in um, native Kubernetes construct. So if we extend this idea uh, to managing infrastructure. Could we use CLD to manage infrastructure? And the answer is, of course, yes. So think about we define the controller and then we submit a CLD to say, hey, I want to manage machines. And the controller will talk to um, the infrastructure and cloud uh, as uh, one of the methods. So this is uh, something that uh, Admit will definitely share to you about how cluster API works. So. Um, so at this moment, uh, I will uh, gracefully handle, I will have, be happily hand, hand over the stage to Amit to um, talk about what exactly is a cluster API and how it leverage a CLD to extend Kubernetes to manage infrastructure. So the stage is yours, Amit. Thank you, Hin. Uh, that was a great introduction to uh, custom resource definitions. Actually, there's a question from Gopi here for you. Uh, can you please uh, take that uh, uh, while I share my screen? Is it on GitHub, right? Is it the questions about yeah. GitHub? Okay, so uh, I have I have uh, open source. Um, I actually have written a blog about uh, the custom resources definitions. And uh, let me send you the link 
um, while Amit is uh, presenting. And in the blog, there is there will be uh, a link to GitHub and the relevant YAML file that you can have a look at that. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Hin. So let's get started on the cluster API. Uh, I believe everyone can see my slide. Hin, can you confirm that you're seeing the cluster API slide? Perfect. Cool. Great. So the cluster API is a project of the uh, Kubernetes special interest group called Cluster Lifecycle. So if you are if you are following the Kubernetes project, there are multiple such uh, special interest groups which are focused. These are focus groups on you know a particular area of interest. For example, it could be multi-tenancy, or it could be how to consume services on you know uh, public clouds using Kubernetes, right? How do you use service catalogs, etc. Right. So Cluster API is, as you can see, focused on how can we declaratively lifecycle manage Kubernetes clusters, right? And this is a perfect segue into what you know Hin was talking about on how can you extend Kubernetes uh, to have custom resource definitions uh, built into the cluster, and how can you have controllers, you know, acting on these custom resource definitions. So I'll quickly go through what is it, why do we need it and what does it do and then dive into a demo so that it all you know is clear how you can actually implement it so cluster api uh, it provides a framework through the kubernetes kubernetes operators and custom resource definitions for lifecycle managing uh, kubernetes clusters right what can it do the main scope and objective of cluster api is lifecycle management of these clusters create scale upgrade and destroy. How can you do this uh, in a consistent fashion across different infrastructure providers? That's a very important point. How can you do it across different infrastructure providers, right? Because uh, the way you spin up a Kubernetes cluster, if you are doing it by yourself uh, on AWS might be different to what you are doing uh, on uh, Google Cloud versus uh, in your data center on vSphere. So this kind, kind of streamlines uh, and provides an API built into Kubernetes uh, for you to spin up uh, clusters on different infrastructure providers. So why do we need it? What's the need for having this? There have been multiple tools which have been created by the community to address this problem of how to stand up a uh, uh, highly available and secure Kubernetes cluster, right? Kubernetes is a complex system that relies on several components. It's a distributed system. You know, forget Kubernetes for a uh, moment. If you are standing up any uh, uh, distributed system for that matter, it's a hard task to get all the parameters right. There has to be some kind of leader election and a lot of things going on in a distributed system to uh, get it up and running, right? Kubernetes is no different. So these are some typical questions that you will be uh, faced with uh, while you are up to setting up Kubernetes clusters, right? How can I consistently provision machines, load balancers, VPCs, basically infrastructure across uh, multiple providers, uh, infrastructure providers? That's day one, right? Day one operations is that part. How can I automate this, right? Day two operations. How can I automate cluster lifecycle management, inc including things like upgrades and cluster deletion, right? How can I scale out the worker nodes? How can I scale in uh, the uh, control nodes? So these are the questions which are to be taken care of as part of the day two operation. Cluster API addresses this, uh, all these pain points, uh, which we'll see very soon. Now, the third question is, how can I scale these processes to manage any number of clusters, right? While, when Kubernetes became an open source project in 2014 and when uh, enterprises started adopting it, there were not, uh, I, would, I wouldn't say there were a good set of tools to manage uh, the whole life cycle as well as create uh, Kubernetes clusters. So uh, some customers or some uh, enterprises went and started creating large clusters and making it multi-tenant by you know, using, carving out namespaces, right? Recently, what I've been seeing uh, in the field is um, customers are creating multiple smaller clusters uh, because it has become easier. The community has put in a lot of effort to make it easier to create uh, multiple Kubernetes clusters versus one large cluster, right? So, uh, VMware Tanzu Kubernetes Grid and the Cluster API, what's the relationship there? So Tanzu Kubernetes Grid is our uh, multi-cloud Kubernetes offering 
which helps you run CNCF confirm and Kubernetes clusters on multiple clouds, be it in your data center on vSphere or uh, on any of these hyperscalers or uh, in your edge locations. It provides you a consistent uh, operation, operations experience for you to deploy Kubernetes clusters, right? And we are betting really uh, on the cluster API and have contributed significantly uh, into this effort, including others, uh, other special interest groups. Right, uh, so Cluster API is not only important to the broader Kubernetes ecosystem, but also serves as a core underpinnings behind VMware Tanzu Kubernetes Grid. So if you are a vSphere customer with, you know, vSphere 7 uh, in there, it's already built into the ESXi, what we're talking about here, so that you can declaratively create Kubernetes clusters uh, with vSphere 7. And uh, we, have, uh, we have got that to the other hyperscalers as well. Currently we support AWS and I think we just released Azure, but uh, our support for other uh, infrastructure as a service is coming soon. So Cluster API provider, uh, vSphere or cap -free. So the way Cluster API work is, works is, if you have done any kind of programming, <laughs> sorry, object-oriented programming uh, specifically, you have this idea of an interface and uh, a class implementing that inter interface, right? So it's not a hundred percent. It's it's not an uh, it's not a hundred percent accurate uh, description of it, but uh, you can think about it that way. So Cluster API provides this very high level interface, and uh, Cap Free provides those implementations which are specific to vSphere. For example, how do I spin up a virtual machine? on vSphere via the cluster API. The cluster API would be delegating those parts to the cluster API provider for vSphere. So as you can imagine, any infrastructure as a service which wants to incorporate cluster API would have to implement their uh, uh, interface uh, or provider uh, to make it work uh, with cluster API, right? So you can see uh, the uh, Cluster API implementation, uh, provider implementation for Azure and AWS, Alibaba Cloud, and many other different infrastructure as a service as well. So you can think of uh, the relationship uh, like this. It's like a shim layer between the uh, Cluster API and the provider, uh, that is vSphere or AWS or whatever that is. So in this case, uh, it's a Cluster API provider for vSphere, and that's what I'll be showing in the demo. Sorry, that was a that's a good blog uh, at the end if you want to read more about the cluster API provider for vSphere. Okay, so I cannot see the question uh, screen right now because I am in full screen. Uh, Hin, are there any questions so far, or should I just continue? Uh, no, please continue. I will let you know. Thank you. All right. So thanks. So these these are the steps uh, that you would need uh, to incorporate cluster API into your uh, uh, infrastructure and spin up uh, workload clusters. So let me explain what this is. Right. It might look like too complicated, but it's not. The first thing you need to do is uh, to create a bootstrap cluster. The entire the whole idea of having this bootstrap cluster is to spin up a management cluster. Right. Once the management cluster is up and running, you don't need this bootstrap cluster anymore. You can just use the management cluster. So you can delete this bootstrap cluster. So that's why it's uh, a cluster of something like uh, created using kind. Right. It's uh, it's an ephemeral cluster. You'll just throw it away once it's done. So once that is done, a management cluster is up and running. So let's take the case of uh, let's say AWS. You spin up a management cluster on AWS using the cluster API, which is installed on the bootstrap cluster. Once that's up and running, you can make the management cluster as a cluster API uh, provision cluster, right? So you install the cluster API controllers and the custom resource definitions into the management cluster. Now, what that helps you do is you can now start spinning up workload clusters declaratively using the management cluster, right? That is, that is the reference architecture uh, you would be using to uh, use the cluster API to create more Kubernetes clusters, right? It's funny when you think about it, you're using Kubernetes to create more Kubernetes clusters. But for the purposes of this demo, I'm going to make it simpler. I'm just going to have uh, uh, a management cluster. I'm going to uh, treat this as a management cluster, even though it's a bootstrap cluster. And I have my uh, infrastructure of, as a service, which is uh, VMware vSphere here. So the first step for me is to bring up this uh, um, 
management cluster on my laptop. So I'm going to do this entire demo uh, in the next uh, 30 minutes. Hopefully the demo gods are with me and uh, I will get till the end, uh, to the end. All right, Hin, can you please confirm you're able to see my terminal? Cool. Yes, I can see that. All right, thanks. It would be better if the phone is a little bit larger. Okay. How is this? Much better. Larger than, all right, okay. Okay, so I'm going to create a cluster on my laptop. So uh, kind stands for uh, Kubernetes in Docker. So it just creates one Docker container and installs Kubernetes within it, right? And that's more than enough for this uh, demo and as a bootstrap cluster. But as I said, I'm using this uh, ephemeral cluster on my laptop as a management cluster. So the next step for me would be once this is up and running, I'm going to install uh, the cluster API and the uh, cluster API vSphere provider as well. So I am up and running with my cluster. So if I do this, I should be able to see uh, pods in my current um, uh, management cluster. It's a brand new cluster, just 12 seconds old. Right, so what I'm going to do next is to install um, the cluster API and the cluster API provider for vSphere, right? So let me go through the slides so that you can all follow along. So, the, so I've installed this. I'm, I'm done with the create management cluster on the laptop. The next step I'm going to do is uh, init the infrastructure, basically install cluster API, right? So. So I am installing the cluster API and the cluster uh, API provider for vSphere uh, onto my management cluster right now. And this is going to take two to three minutes. While that's happening, I'm going to show you what it's going to install. So for that, I need to get the cube config for the, for the kind cluster, which I just created. And I need to set my kube config to that one so that I can access it from here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to watch what is actually getting installed here. So it's just installing the certificate manager. The next step would be to install the uh, providers and the cluster API as well. Since it takes Uh, what it's going to do is create the custom resource definition. This is very similar to what uh, Hin demonstrated in his demo, where he was creating custom resource definitions for MySQL, but here we are creating custom uh, resource definitions for cluster, because that is what we are going to create. We are going to create clusters. Hin was creating MySQL databases, but I'm going to create clusters. For Kubernetes to understand, when I actually say Kubernetes create a cluster, we have to first install the CRDs and the controllers which will act on those uh, custom resource definitions. So that's exactly what's happening right now. So once that's installed, the next step is the cluster CTL tool provides, sorry, the cluster CTL tool provides uh, a command called config, which lets you define the configuration for your cluster. So in this case, I'm going to say, Hey, uh, create a cluster named dev001. The Kubernetes version, which I want to run is 1.17.3. I need one control plane and one uh, worker node, sorry, one master and one worker node and uh, write out that configuration into dev001 cluster, right? So let's check whether uh, the install is uh, done. It's not yet done, it's still creating the cert manager and then it's going to install the cluster API. So I will keep going. So once that's done, uh, I will get this uh, dev001 cluster.yaml, right? The next step is very simple. I'm going to say, hey, Kubernetes, uh, apply this uh, YAML file, that is the resource definitions within that uh, YAML file onto the cluster, right? Now, this is the interesting part, and this is where the CREs and the controllers kick in. Uh, the controllers which are installed as part of the cluster API are constantly watching uh, the custom resource definitions of a particular type via the API server. Uh, so anything that goes into HCD, uh, the controllers will get notified. So 
the controllers get notified, hey, there is a request for a cluster named dev001, and this is the configuration. So Kubernetes is really good at you know, uh, bringing the desired state, uh, sorry, uh, reconciling the actual state to the desired state. Right. So currently, the actual state is there is no cluster called dev001, but the desired state is there is an intent to have dev001 as a cluster. So the controllers using the cap v, this is where cap v comes in. The uh, cluster API uh, vSphere provider comes in. The cluster API calls into the uh, cap v to say, hey, uh, we need to spin up some uh, uh, virtual machines and do the uh, networking, etc. between these. So since I said one master and one worker node, this is exactly what will come up uh, on vSphere, right? So let's have a look. Yep. So let me minimize just to show you. Uh, yep. Uh, all the all the components are installed, but you can see some of the parts are still creating here. Uh, the most important of these is you can see the cluster API controller manager, which is uh, running a few controllers. And you can also see the cap v controller manager here, right? So these two will work together to actually, you know, uh, bring together this cluster, right? Once uh, once all of these goes into running, that's one. Uh, that's when we can, you know, actually uh, create that um, cluster definition. But you should we should now be able to see the CRDs which are installed on the cluster. So if I were to make an analogy, this is this is exactly similar to what uh, Hin was showing when he did this. You could you could see uh, MySQL definitions, but uh, custom resources. But uh, here, sorry, I should have done CRDs. You can see there are a few CRDs which have been installed in the cluster. The most important one is the cluster CRD, which we are going to create, and obviously the vSphere implementations of clusters through the providers have been created as well. Okay, uh, this is still creating in a creating state. Um, maybe in a couple of, maybe a few, uh, few more seconds, they should all go into uh, running. So while we are waiting Let for me the see. cluster to be available, yep. please feel free to ask questions in the chat window. I will be uh, taking care of that and we'll summarize the event after the demonstration. Yep, cool. So uh, while it is creating, I'm just you know uh, trying to see whether I can create this um, cluster definition when that's going uh, on. Let's, let's, let's check it out. Not 100% sure whether all those parts need to be up and running. Looks like it has created it. Let's look at what a cluster definition looks like, right? So as you can see here, uh, this is the custom resource definition for a cluster, and that's uh, the name for the cluster is dev001. It takes some defaults of this, uh, uh, the IP address ranges, et cetera. What's important to uh, note here is if you scroll down, uh, there is a definition for what is the number of replicas that would be required for each of these, right? So in the, uh, this is the uh, control plane uh, custom resource definition using cube admin. So here you can see I've requested one replica of the control plane. And if I scroll down more, I should be able to see the machine deployment, which is actually uh, the number of, uh, which takes care of the number of workers. You should see one replica as well. So this is this is pretty much what the custom resource definitions that will be uh, ingested look like. Yep, uh, I can see some of them are running. Uh, this is a demo. Something has to go wrong. So I think it's taking more uh, time than required. Um, yep, I can see one more uh, the bootstrap system going into running as well. Hopefully, all these will uh, turn into uh, running soon. So once this is done, I will be able to apply this uh, custom resource definition into uh, the cluster. So the next step will be kubectl apply uh, dev001. So when I do this, what I'm expecting is I, sh I should be seeing uh, the Kubernetes cluster uh, showing up in my vSphere here, right? So hopefully uh, it comes up soon. Uh, 
it doesn't take so much time around. I think it takes around four minutes. I'm not hundred percent sure. Anyway, so let let's wait for another thirty seconds. Uh, if it still doesn't uh, go into running, then I have a recorded video as well as a fallback. I will I will show you how that looks. Yeah, Sin mentioned if there are any questions, feel free to post uh, in the chat window. So, um, I mean, if while while we are waiting for the um, the awesome cluster API to come up with um, to start running, so um, maybe I should like um, summarize a little bit. Like uh, right now, you just created a uh, Kubernetes cluster locally in your PC yep. using a tools called yep. Khan. So Kubernetes in, yep. in in a nested Docker environment. So that one is yep. purely for um, management, for management purpose. Correct. So yep. and then because your your um, eventual goal is to create Kubernetes cluster in vSphere, right? So so yep. there is a, a tools called um, well an, a project called Cluster API that will talk to vSphere. Mm -hmm and then create an entirely new Kubernetes cluster for you. So this yeah. cluster API has to run somewhere, right? So the cluster yeah. API is now running in the kind Kubernetes running in your PC. So the kind in your yeah. PC is just like purely management installed it with cluster API. And then the cluster API is, uh, is uh, interestingly is, um, actually run well using the CLD I just mentioned uh, before this section. So um, I, I, yep. think, I think this is like amazingly that you can run a, a bootstrapping cluster so that you can uh, start Kubernetes cluster in multi-cloud environment. So I, I think yeah, is, it's is anything I'm missing there or is it like our ultimate goal, right? Should be no, no, that's what that is that is spot on, and yeah, as you mentioned, it's amazing that you can you know spin up Kubernetes clusters uh, that quickly using the uh, kind using kind Kubernetes in Docker, right? So uh, while I was while you were saying that, Hin, I was thinking maybe this the reason why uh, you know it's taking so much time is maybe I'm on a call and more I/O is being used yeah. and you know the containers are not starting. But anyway, I I'm going to uh, try and deploy that. Uh, um, cluster definition, which I just created and see what happens. I would imagine that it would fail because uh, the web hooks are not up and running, but let's see what happens. Oops, it's created. Let's see. Okay, so what I have done now is I've created a dev 001 cluster. Let me look at what the controllers are doing now, right? So, yep, looks like everything is running. So what I'm interested in is what exactly is the role of, uh, okay, I think uh, we have a problem there. Yeah, what I'm interested in is what is this particular controller going to do when I have submitted uh, a request like that, right? So let us look at the logs for the controller. Um, in the namespace cap free system and the container is manager. I want to look at the logs. All right. I thought I, okay, I copied the wrong one, sorry. So namespace is cap free system container I want to look into is manager within that pod. And I want to look at this one. Right. So what's happening is I've deployed this and I would expect to see some action here. As you can see, the virtual machines are getting configured, uh, powered on in vSphere. Are you able to see that screen, Hin? Yeah, I can able to see the screen a little bit smaller than expected. Okay. I don't know how to increase this one. Zoom in. Yeah, I'm trying to zoom in, but uh, unfortunately, it's not <laughs> zooming in. <laughs> I, can, so, I can see there's something extra, something doing yeah. on the VCA. So, 
Yeah, so what's happened is there's a load balancer which has been stood up uh, to load balance traffic to the uh, control plane nodes, and the control plane node is also up and running, right? So the next step, if you look, if you keep watching these logs, or what you should be seeing is uh, uh, the worker node being uh, stood up, right? So that's the next step the controller is going to do. So the cap fee controller has kicked in based on the custom resource definitions that are being uh, sent to the server and uh, the load balancer for the control node and the uh, master node is up. Uh, the worker node will be up in some time as well, right? Once that is up, what we can do is we can now get the uh, credentials for this new workload cluster and start deploying uh, applications onto it. So that's the next step uh, I would like to demonstrate. So you can see now the master node, sorry, the worker node is also up and running. Uh, if I look at the virtual machine, I should be able to see it booting up. The point here is not you know, how great this uh, demo is. <laughs> the point is I'm not doing anything related to vSphere. I'm not logging into vCenter, starting up a script or you know whatever to spin up this cluster. It's all managed by the cluster API, right? And that's, uh, that's a consistent way. Uh, the way I'll stand up Kubernetes clusters across different clouds is going to be the exact same uh, steps I'm taking here, except for uh, the uh, the provider will be different, uh, but the cluster API remains the same. That's the whole idea of having that uh, uh, application programming interface in the first place, right? So what has happened is uh, the cluster is up and uh, it's fine. What I can see here, if I, See, this is a custom resource definition, right? The cluster. If I do get clusters, you can see the dev001 cluster has been provisioned and ready to go, right? So that's uh, well and good. How many How many more minutes do we have, Him? Uh, we have around two more minutes. OK, so I'm not going to deploy any workloads onto this cluster. All I'm going to show you is how can we scale once we have deployed, right? So. Mm -hmm. This is the command which I'm going to do to scale the cluster, right? So as soon as I do this, uh, the controller will kick in and start deploying worker nodes onto the uh, vSphere uh, environment, right? So if I watch the logs, you, can, you, should, you should see uh, uh, the controller continuously trying to reconcile state and boom, you can see five worker nodes created here, right? So Point is, you can use common Kubernetes commands to actually uh, scale the control node uh, nodes, that's a master nodes, or your worker nodes via the cluster API. Hopefully, uh, you know, as part of this demo, I wanted to demonstrate how can you get the credentials for the, uh, you know, newly spun up cluster and deploy an app load, sorry, workload onto it. But uh, unfortunately, uh, there was, you know, a small delay uh, in the demo. So, uh, I think I will wrap up here and open it up for questions in the next one or two minutes. Yeah, I can Thank see you. there is one question. Um, the question mm -hmm. was, can I use K-natives as a developer and create these? So um, I, I'm trying to trying to interpret um, the, the questions was trying to say, hey, can, could I use K-native to create Kubernetes cluster? So um, I, I think those are two different things. The first thing is uh, K-native is actually uh, some serverless uh, when you want to run your application as a serverless or function as a service way of um, your applications. Um, yeah. So it, typically you will uh, you will write your application using uh, what together with Knative and then submit the, the function as a service uh, to run inside uh, Kubernetes. So, um, but for cl cluster API, we are not talking about the application running inside Kubernetes. For cluster API, we are talking about how to provision the infrastructure required by, by the uh, Kubernetes cluster itself. So after provisioning, just like uh, what Amit have uh, displayed in this diagram, after you have provisioned the dev 001 cluster, then, of course, the next step is how do you deploy your application? Your application may be a Python application, Java applications. At that moment, then you think about deploying clean native in the dev 001 uh, cluster. Um, so I, I think that's a two, two different, different, um, different project. The, the cluster API is more like ops infrastructure. 
Knative is like in the developer uh, area where you can write your apps as a serverless uh, application. So, um, so exactly, so I, I think I completely agree with what you said, uh, Hin. Yes, um, Knative is a function as a service. How can you do this consistently across Kubernetes? It has three different, uh, I think, uh, build, eventing, and uh, serving as three modules within Knative. Yeah, it's a function as a service uh, which can run on Kubernetes. Yeah, I, I think to compare a uh, cluster API, uh, you, you, you should compare cluster API with uh, kube admin. You should compare a uh, cluster API with uh, Kubernetes. Kubicon and yeah. Brain, yeah. Those, those kind of stuff um, is like, how do we provision the, the cluster, cluster itself? So, um, but cluster API is, itself is rather, um, it's pretty um, latest and up to date. Um, and uh, we were talking about a, a lot of, uh, in the SIG, there were a lot of chat, chatting about uh, how do we use uh, cluster API to, um, as a high level, to group all the functionality around Kube admin, Kube spray, um, other other way of provisioning um, Kubernetes. So uh, that that should be the, the scope of that, but uh, not in the application layer. Uh, how to run uh, serverless commands, different cluster, uh, Kubernetes cluster. I, I think that's two different conversations there. Yep, that's right. So finally, I had some references uh, which might be helpful if you want to, you know, look in. Uh, to more depth uh, into cluster API. There's a GitHub project there. Very good book on cluster API. Uh, there, if you want to write your own controllers, then, the, then you have Cube Builder. Uh, there's a book available on that as well. And finally, if you want to look at Tanzu Kubernetes Grid, uh, reach out to us and we'll be happy to uh, uh, take you through what, uh, what it means. Right. Uh, that's it from me, Hin. Back to you. Uh, and yeah. uh, all right. So thank you, thank you for the attendance, and uh, thank you, Amif, uh, for the uh, excellent uh, presentation of that. So uh, in the chat window, uh, I'm going to leave uh, our, our contact method to that. I, I, I know that there are some questions about, uh, I see some workshop on Tensu. Is there anything for that? Uh, well, we do have a, a quite a bit of materials that we can share to you. Uh, so please send us an email. We can forward you uh, a, a list of links that uh, we all can can uh, share. We all can um, uh, help you get started in Tensu portfolio on that. So with that, thank you and yep. thank you for your time. Thank you for your time, everyone. Cheers. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.